what could have frightened her to the point of causing her to scream and disrupt the entire hospital? Nurse Mabin, with over two decades of nursing experience, had never encountered anything as terrifying as what she witnessed in the ward of the girl known as Sleeping Beauty. It's intriguing to note that for over 15 years, those two words succinctly encapsulated the story of our main character, Luz Maria. Fifteen years prior, Maria, at just eight years old, was discovered unconscious on a bustling sidewalk along one of the city's busiest roads. Placed in a coma and reliant on life support, her school affiliation was determined through the uniform she wore. Authorities mentioned that she was one of the children who made their way to school independently, and nobody knew or had met her parents. Despite exhaustive attempts, every effort to locate Maria's parents proved fruitless. This also meant that there was no one to take care of her hospital bills. Would the young girl be left to perish, or would her parents eventually come forward? Several weeks later, Maria's parents, Sergio and Catalina, finally arrived at the hospital. Sergio and Catalina, an elderly couple who had struggled for years to conceive, were informed by the medical staff about the substantial cost to sustain their daughter's life. After learning this, Catalina broke down in tears, realizing they couldn't afford the medical bills. Without saying a word, she simply walked out of the doctor's office. Sergio made the decision to instruct the removal of Maria from the life support machine. However, everyone in the hospital had developed a strong attachment to Maria and sympathized deeply with her unfortunate circumstances. They were unwilling to witness her demise. Some even went as far as treating her as if she were their own daughter, particularly Nurse Mabin, whose fondness for Maria stood out amongst all. She was the constant presence in Maria's life, engaging in conversations and occasionally playing music for her. Observers witnessing Mabin's profound care for the little girl might have perceived her as more than just a nurse, perhaps even akin to family. Some might have assumed they were related, considering Mabin as Maria's primary caregiver and potentially her guardian angel. Dubbed Sleeping Beauty by the hospital staff due to her striking beauty, Maria became a focal point of affection. Mabin rallied her colleagues, urging them to collectively contribute to the girls' medical expenses, showcasing their collective concern and care for Maria. Among the hospital staff, Dr. Eduardo, the hospital's medical director, offered the largest donation. He, like Mabin, showed immense kindness towards Maria. However, Mabin realized that relying solely on her colleagues might not suffice in covering the girls' ongoing medical bills. Consequently, she took the initiative to set up a GoFundMe page to seek additional assistance for Maria's expenses. The distance between Maria's parents' home and the hospital posed a challenge for the elderly couple. Catalina expressed to Mabin, it's hard for us to be here daily for Maria. Sergio is in a wheelchair, and I can only bring him occasionally. As much as I want to stay by my daughter's side, it takes a toll on my health. You already feel like her second mother. Could you take care of her for me? I'll make sure to visit once or twice every week." Mabin agreed, feeling honored to take on the responsibility of caring for Maria. Several months later, Catalina passed away. Her daughter, Maria, had now been in a coma for over 14 years, causing many to lose hope of her ever regaining consciousness. Amidst this despair, Sergio and Mabin remained the sole optimists. Maria, no longer a child, had grown into a beautiful woman while in a state of unconsciousness. However, she had missed experiencing her teenage years, never attending high school or participating in a prom. If and when she woke up, Maria would find herself a stranger in her own body, navigating a new world without her mother and bearing responsibilities far beyond what was expected of a young woman. She would exist as an eight-year-old within the body of a young adult. This became the new reality that Sleeping Beauty was confronted with. One day, while en route to work, Mabin was involved in a severe accident that left her in a wheelchair. Doctors predicted a lengthy recovery period. With Mabin unable to care for Maria, the responsibility fell upon Dr. Eduardo. After some time, a nurse informed Dr. Eduardo that Maria had shown signs of irregular menstruation. Upon conducting tests, the physician assured that it was not a cause for alarm. 
Mabin felt restless when away from Maria's side. She persistently requested Dr. Eduardo to send her updates, such as pictures and videos, to stay informed about the girl's well-being. It took Mabin six months to recuperate from her injuries. Once declared fit to walk again, she hurried to the hospital to see Maria. The nurse conveyed her excitement, akin to a mother reuniting with her child after 180 days of separation. However, upon seeing Maria, Mabin noticed a concealed or perhaps unusual change. Why did Maria appear so different? Yes, she had physically matured over those six months, but Mabin also observed a considerable weight gain. This kind of transformation didn't seem solely due to aging. Moreover, Maria was covered with more than one blanket. Mabin, with a hushed voice, whispered to herself. Upon lifting the covers, the 47-year-old nurse was left stunned by what she discovered. Mabin couldn't grasp what she had just witnessed, instead, she bolted out of the room, shouting for Dr. Eduardo. The first nurse she encountered in the corridor informed her that he wouldn't be available at the hospital for the next two days. Despite repeated inquiries from the nurse about the issue, Mabin was unable to articulate a response. Instead, she pulled the nurse into Maria's ward to witness what she had seen. Stammering, Mabin expressed her shock, how is she pregnant? She is pregnant, isn't she? Her stomach looks slightly bigger, and she's gained weight, so she has to be pregnant. Other nurses and doctors had also gathered in the room. One of them clarified that they had noticed changes, but Dr. Eduardo had conducted tests that indicated otherwise. However, Mabin insisted on conducting new tests to ensure that nothing had changed. The subsequent test results confirmed her fears, Maria was indeed pregnant, except this Maria didn't have the same circumstances as the mother of Jesus. Someone had taken advantage of her. An internal investigation was recommended, although Mabin disagreed. When Sergio was informed about the situation, he was furious and involved the police. Two months later, Maria's baby girl was delivered via C-section, initiating a search for the father. Every male employee in the hospital underwent DNA tests as part of the investigation. The test results uncovered Dr. Eduardo as the father of Maria's daughter. Exploiting his position, he ensured that any attempts to expose him failed. Nurses revealed that he often handled the tests whenever suspicions arose, seemingly manipulating the situation to evade detection. If Dr. Eduardo had been present upon Mabin's return, he would have likely thwarted her efforts. However, after the completion of the DNA tests, Dr. Eduardo vanished without a trace. Without Dr. Eduardo's monthly financial contribution, sustaining Maria on life support became impossible. Though the consensus among many, including Mabin, was to let Maria go, Mabin refused to relinquish hope. In a final, desperate attempt, just before disconnecting Sleeping Beauty from the life support machine, Mabin placed Maria's baby girl on her chest. Initially crying inconsolably, the baby eventually found peace on her mother's body. It seemed as if Maria's presence calmed the storm within her daughter. With bated breath, Sergio, Mabin, and most of the hospital staff watched, hoping for a miracle after 15 years. They yearned for a miracle, otherwise, this might mark the tragic end of Maria's life. However, some stories don't unfold as desired. After waiting several anxious minutes, the anticipated miracle failed to manifest. Mabin stood in a corner of the hospital, unable to contain her tears despite her efforts. Another nurse gently picked up the now sleeping baby, and as everyone resigned themselves to fate, the infant's cry pierced the air. It was at that moment that something extraordinary occurred. Like the mythical phoenix rising from the ashes, after over 5,400 days, Maria opened her eyes for the first time. Her solitary word was, water. Though Maria's life would undergo profound changes, Sergio was overjoyed to have his daughter back. Similarly, Mabin, who had been an integral part of Maria's life, could now also be deemed Sleeping Beauty's mother. The journey of Mabin and Maria is a testament to hope and resilience. It's a narrative of unwavering dedication and the unbreakable human spirit. Until next time, stay safe.
Next, let's enjoy another wonderful story. Hello, welcome to the channel, enjoy watching. The hospital room carried the scent of chlorine mingled with the delicate fragrance of white roses. Miguel Gomez, with care, arranged the fresh blooms in a tall glass vase on the bedside table next to his wife, Marta, who lay on the hospital bed. She was in a deep coma caused by an enlarged brain tumor, her life now reliant on the skilled hands of the doctors at the esteemed hospital. Marta, a young woman of 25, had been rushed in urgently only a few hours earlier. On his 29th birthday, Miguel gazed at his wife, a facade of sorrow etched on his face, pretending to be the devoted husband. He tenderly clasped Marta's fingers, cautiously surveying the room to ensure their privacy remained undisturbed. Leaning in close to Marta's ear, he whispered softly. Oh, Marta, your birthday gift is beyond anything I could have imagined. Thank you. At that moment, the door creaked open, and a man swiftly entered, immediately adopting the posture of a grief-stricken spouse. He knelt by the bed, feigning sobs. My darling, my precious girl. How could this happen? Why, God, why? McGill buried his face in his sleeve, feigning anguish and sorrow. Mr. Miguel Gomez, I apologize for the interruption, but there are some papers regarding your wife's hospital stay that require your signature, said the intruding figure, attempting to redirect attention. The doctor caring for Marta gently touched her husband's shoulder, attempting to console him. McGill slowly turned around, discreetly wiping his eyes to create a teary appearance. Doctor, please tell me the truth. How is she, he pleaded. The surgeon, a bit puzzled, responded cautiously, avoiding intricate medical details, your wife's condition is currently stable but serious. Our efforts were to save her life, but it will take several weeks before we can assess her recovery. McGill pretended to wipe away imaginary tears and inquired slowly, can you tell me honestly if there's any chance she'll awaken from the coma soon? I need to prepare for the worst. Drawing up legal documents at this stage might be premature, replied the doctor. We cannot predict the future. Rushing into such decisions isn't advisable. Why plan for her demise already, Mr. Gomez, the doctor asked, eyeing him suspiciously. It's premature for us to make assumptions, the doctor asserted. Illnesses like Martyr's condition require comprehensive, prolonged treatment. Even the slightest response to external stimuli, such as a reaction to movement or light in the room, could be deemed progress. McGill redirected his attention to his wife lying on the bed. Despite her pallor, she retained a striking beauty reminiscent of the day they first met. She appeared as though she was caught in an eternal slumber, a dream from which she might never awaken. After tenderly caressing his wife's arm, Miguel rose and delicately guided the doctor aside, ensuring the gravity of his words wasn't lost. So, you're implying that the likelihood of my wife emerging from her coma within the next year, fully functional, is nearly non-existent. Am I understanding you correctly? Miguel questioned the surgeon seriously. The doctor hesitated, displaying a hint of vulnerability that Miguel keenly observed, the nervous twitch at the corner of his mouth, the trembling of his hands, and the sweat on his forehead affirmed Miguel's interpretation. Well, the chances aren't absolute zero, but they are indeed slim, the surgeon reluctantly admitted, his gaze shifting uncomfortably. Recognizing the doctor's vulnerability, Miguel decided to leverage it to exert pressure. He had heard rumors circulating in the hospital about the chief surgeon's after-hours habits, indulging in alcohol or engaging in card games with emergency department colleagues to manage stress. Having spent considerable time with his wife, Miguel had learned much about such sensitive matters. Now, he aimed to uncover the price for a favorable outcome. Doctor, can I ask for your assistance in keeping my wife in a coma? Not for an extended duration, just a few months initially. Then, I'll proceed to sign the papers to withdraw life support, Miguel propositioned the surgeon, struggling to articulate his request. Instantly taken aback, the surgeon's eyes widened in shock, grappling with the young man's blatant cynicism. Are you serious? The surgeon whispered in disbelief. However, Gomez halted any further inquiries by displaying a substantial five-digit figure on his smartphone screen.
Is this amount agreeable, Benito Hidalgo? Miguel pressed, insistent. I can arrange for more, but I need an assurance that she'll pass away before spring. The surgeon remained silent, his Adam's apple twitching momentarily in nervous response before swallowing uneasily. Miguel swiped his thumb across the screen, instantly altering the figure to a six-digit amount. The surgeon, overwhelmed with a mix of fear and allure, was nearly speechless. Wordlessly gesturing toward Marta, the surgeon silently questioned why such a monstrous act was being contemplated against her. Miguel smirked in response, unfazed. Benito Hidalgo, why has your conscience suddenly awakened? Let's get to the point. Do you agree or not? I don't have time to negotiate. After all, I have almost nothing to lose. How can you even conceive such a plan, the surgeon raised his voice, aghast. I can't simply halt her treatment. I'm a doctor, I'm meant to save lives, not end them. Doctor, I'm not asking you to end her life. I need you to modify her treatment, deviating significantly from the usual protocol, Miguel explained calmly. You prescribe the medications, and I'll comply with whatever treatment plan you decide for my wife. Placing a hand on the doctor's shoulder, Miguel grinned menacingly. Do we have a deal? Can I count on you? Benito Hidalgo hesitated briefly, rubbing the edge of his robe, before succumbing to his greed. Fine. I don't see the point in aggressive therapy. I'll start with minimal medication doses and re-evaluate if there's no improvement," the surgeon conceded reluctantly. Miguel acknowledged the agreement and hinted at making the initial payment upon receiving specific test results. And remember, Miguel cautioned, our conversation stays strictly confidential. With a nod, the surgeon hastily exited the room, attending to other patients requiring his attention and help. As the doctor quietly shut the door behind him, a subtle yet unmistakable air of disdain lingered in his glance towards Gomez, who stood frozen by his comatose wife. Swiftly, the doctor addressed Miguel with an air of urgency, Miguel Gomez, I maintain an agnostic standpoint in my beliefs, driven by the dictates of my profession. Yet, your actions toward your wife are, at the very least, beyond the bounds of human decency. Momentarily hesitant, Miguel replied without facing the surgeon, his indifferent tone resonating, I haven't engaged your services to deliberate upon my humanity. I compensate you for your silent adherence to your duties, not to pass judgment on my decisions. Now, depart, your patients await your attention. A monster, the surgeon muttered to himself, beads of sweat forming, as he departed to tend to his medical duties. Unbeknownst to the cunning and callous spouse for the chief surgeon, Marta had regained consciousness but remained disoriented, unable to grasp her surroundings or the ongoing events. Initially comforted by familiar voices, the ensuing information appeared so irrational and disjointed that Marta dismissed it as a nightmarish figment of her illness-ridden mind, struggling to open her eyes and dismiss the distressing revelations as mere phantoms. However, her physical weakness hindered her control over her body. A subsequent excruciating headache convinced her of the dreadful reality revealed in the intensive care unit, her beloved husband's calculated intent to eliminate her. In her fragile state, she realized his cold-blooded plan to manipulate her doctor into neglecting her care, paving the way for the withdrawal of life support. It was a timid yet devilishly simple scheme, a plan so calculated that Miguel's hand might not have quivered when sanctioning her fate. At first, Comprehending the situation seemed inconceivable to Marta. Yet, beneath the surface, she had long observed changes in her husband, starting from the moment the oncologist delivered her diagnosis. Suddenly, Miguel transitioned from his usual focus solely on his design department to an active engagement in their mutual company's affairs. Simultaneously, his attention to her health surged remarkably, leading them to frequent high-end clinics for repeated tests. Disbelieving the severity of her sudden illness, Miguel's newfound involvement stemmed from his desire to grasp every facet of Marta's condition, ostensibly fueled by concern for her well-being. Don't be distressed too soon, honey, her husband coaxed. Perhaps these doctors erred. Tests could have been mixed up or improperly taken. 
It might be due to their personal incompetency or simply greed. You know how these specialists exploit people like us for every penny until the very end. I know, McGill, she replied weakly, still unable to move much, not even her eyelids. Only now, in her half-conscious state, did Marta grasp why her husband suddenly felt the need to scrutinize her tests meticulously. He just wanted to ensure there was no chance for me, she realized bitterly. He aimed to secure his future, playing the role of a caring spouse for appearances if need be, in the years ahead. Marta overheard her husband's cell phone vibrating regularly. She heard McGill's conversations, notably with someone distinctly female. Hi, sweetheart. Yes, still at the hospital. No, don't worry. I'll drop by tonight. I have a visit scheduled with our family notary. Yeah, I'm interested in knowing how quickly I can claim my wife's property after her passing. No, I'm pretty certain she won't recover. Yes, in a coma. This isn't a jest anymore. Marta felt an intense surge of fiery rage and anger swelling within her. Suddenly, she sensed a metallic tang in her mouth, the taste of her own blood, perhaps from inadvertently biting her cheek as she tried to move her tongue and clench her teeth, a subconscious action reminding her of her vitality and resolve. Meanwhile, her husband continued, whispering affectionate words to his mistress over the phone. She was certain it was his mistress. Miguel bid adieu to his paramour, promising a visit soon. Suppressing her anger with a tremendous force of will, Marta concentrated, realizing that an increased pulse might reveal her regained consciousness to the monitoring devices. Pretending to be unconscious, she sought composure, recognizing the immediate need to reclaim control over her body. See you tomorrow, dear, Miguel tenderly bid farewell to his wife. I'll ensure you're as motionless and unfeeling as before. That's what I want from you. Be obedient and don't agitate your dear husband. She willed herself to remain still, focusing on regaining her strength, determined to regain command over her body before revealing her awakening. Marta sensed the light brush of her husband's lips on her forehead. If not for her paralysis, she'd have slapped the scoundrel so hard, leaving his face as red as a boiled lobster. As she heard the door close behind him, she relaxed. Time was essential for her to recuperate and regain her bearings, but it was time she didn't possess in abundance. All right, my love. Let's see who triumphs in your deceitful game, she resolved within herself. Marta's survival instinct surged, compelling her to compose herself and unify her emotions. It took immense self-control not to reveal her condition by inadvertently pressing the nurse's emergency button with her fingertip. Sensing the rush of blood coursing through her veins, she focused on inching toward regaining sensation in her limbs, willing herself to relax despite the urgency. Gradually, millimeter by millimeter, her limbs regained sensitivity. Clutching her bedsheet tightly, Marta coerced her body to unwind, slipping into a comforting slumber almost instantly despite the overwhelming stress and emotional turmoil she had endured. Sleep intertwined with memories in her mind, painting vivid pictures of her troubled childhood and adolescence. Marta's early years were spent in an orphanage, unaware of her biological parents. She was bestowed with a beautiful name at the orphanage, known for her affable nature and blonde silky hair. Legends at the orphanage suggested she was found in a basket left near the doorstep during a fierce downpour. Adopted by a childless engineer couple from a modest town when she turned five, Marta found solace in her new family. Despite not being affluent, the Gomez family lived comfortably, owning a decent car, a three-room apartment in a good neighborhood, and a small countryside retreat. Her fondest memories were entwined with their country house, where Marta felt an inexplicable serenity, fostering hope for a brighter future. She watched her grandmother nurture diverse herbs in their little garden, envisioning it as a mystical enchanted haven guarded by her beloved grandmother, a guardian against nosy neighbors. Grandma Elena admired the vivid imagination of the young girl. Initially hesitant about her daughter and son-in-law's inability to have biological children, Elena, a wise woman with life experience, didn't oppose their decision to adopt from an orphanage. 
When little Marta first met her grandmother, Elena quickly found a connection with her. Marta happily told other children that she had her real grandmother in a magical garden, an idea often met with laughter from other kids who were aware that the Gomez family didn't possess such a place. However, Marta clung to her imaginative world, and her parents didn't rush to dispel it. Believe, Catalina, Andres repeatedly reassured his worried wife. When she goes to school, she'll understand that the magical moments are rare and precious. But our neighbors and the other kids might mock her, Catalina fretted. I understand she's happy to be with her real family, but what if her imagination hints at something else? What if it's a sign of a mental illness? I worry about her health and future. We don't know about her biological parents. Perhaps we should consult a doctor. Her father lit a cigarette, regarding his wife with a serious expression. Don't overthink, Catalina. She's just a child, eager to believe in magic and miracles. She's come from an orphanage to a loving home. Imagine yourself in her shoes at six years old. Reflecting on his words, Catalina nodded. I suppose you're right. I've been too anxious because of the gossip and fuss among the children. We shouldn't fret over it now. But I was more practical and rational at her age. I never believed in miracles or Santa Claus. The man grinned warmly and gently caressed her head as he spoke. You'll see, Catalina, our little martyr will surely impress everyone at school. Do you know what they say about children with rich imaginations? They tend to possess outstanding abilities compared to ordinary children. I have a feeling this girl will follow in our footsteps. We'll be proud of her. Catalina had no choice but to agree with her husband. Overall, Marta's childhood in her foster family was joyous and serene. A year later, the girl entered first grade, and it soon became evident that her father was right. She excelled in school, especially in math, strengthening her parents' confidence in their decision to adopt her. Marta finished school with excellent grades, and her final examinations were a breeze, leading her to easily enroll in the mathematics faculty of a prestigious university in the capital city. Though worried, her parents eventually let Marta pursue her studies in the metropolis. Marta reassured them of her intentions. I'm going there to study, not to party. I'll be fine, she assured them before departing. As Marta prepared to leave, she noticed her parents' sadness. She tried to lift their spirits. Mom, Dad, why are you so sad? It's not like I'm off to study in Africa. You should be happy for my good fortune. I never imagined I'd get into one of the top universities. We are very happy for you, sweetheart, Catalina said sympathetically, but she couldn't help expressing her concern. We're just worried, Marta. It's a big city, and you're going alone, Catalina explained. Stop scaring her, her husband chided. She knows her way around. She's not an idiot. Marta nodded in agreement with her father. Dad's right. I know where I should and shouldn't go in the capital. I promise my plans will revolve around exhibitions and museums, if I even have the time for them. I doubt I'll have much leisure time. Catalina eased up a bit but requested, okay, promise to call us every week, though. Marta smiled reassuringly. Of course, Mom. I'll keep you updated. I can't fathom how we'll manage here without you, her mother lamented. Mom, you won't be alone, Marta assured, embracing her tenderly. Dad will always be here to keep you company. Right, Dad? Of course, he affirmed, trying to reassure Catalina. Don't cry. Catalina tried to compose herself. Marta, you have to pack. Your suitcase is ready, and here I am crying. Marta looked at her parents affectionately, feeling a deep bond with them. They were more than just foster parents to her. Grateful for the family she found, Marta began packing and soon embarked on her journey to the capital city by train. As she glanced out the window at the passing forests and tiny towns, she made a silent vow to succeed in the city and never have to return to one of those remote towns. I'll make my parents proud, she promised herself. 
Upon arriving and settling into the dormitory, Marta immersed herself in her studies, which consumed almost all her time. The few spare hours were dedicated to test preparation or leisurely reading, a brief escape from the constant calculations swirling in her mind. From the onset, her professors noticed Marta's exceptional intellectual abilities, propelling her toward significant success in research. She was consistently listed among the best students, earning recognition at the university and invitations to present her work at academic conferences. Graduating with excellent recommendations boosted her confidence in her choices. However, stepping into the professional world posed unforeseen challenges. Despite her stellar academic record, securing a job at her dream company became an uphill battle. Marta's journey was arduous, her dreams of advancing her career seemed distant. With all her qualifications but lacking professional experience, Marta struggled to land a full-time position. Despite her assurances of quality work and discipline, companies hesitated to hire an inexperienced newcomer. Come back in a few years when you've gained more experience, she was repeatedly told, each rejection echoing the need for a richer portfolio alongside her resume. Following those setbacks, the young professional and former student often found herself leaving the office, tears streaming down her cheeks. Her parents, in constant insistence, urged her to return to their hometown. They assured her of their connections and emphasized how her diploma would make her a highly valued professional in any company. Her father, fraught with worry, persistently stressed, how will you secure a good job in the capital? The best positions are acquired through connections. You should come back home. Yet, Marta stood resolute. I can't abandon my dream, Dad, she expressed to Andres during their weekly phone call. If I return now, I'll be breaking the most important promise I made to myself years ago, for a reason. Her parents, albeit sighing in dismay, failed to grasp their daughter's unyielding desire to conquer the bustling metropolis. Despite their reservations about her choices, they respected Marta's determination to remain in the capital. In the interim, she grappled with the financial obligations of her rented room. Having recently moved out of the dormitory after graduating, Marta found her savings from scholarships dwindling. Reluctant to burden her struggling parents, she grappled with the realization that her remaining funds scarcely covered next month's rent. With urgency pressing upon her, Marta scaled back her aspirations and sought employment that wouldn't be hindered by her lack of engineering field experience. After weeks of fruitless job hunting and interviews, she eventually landed an opportunity at a small company specializing in construction equipment. They offered her an internship, potentially leading to permanent employment pending the director's assessment of her performance. Marta eagerly embraced this chance. This job not only ensured her rent and sustenance but also allowed her to stash away some savings monthly. Wanting to alleviate her parents' concerns, she dutifully sent part of her earnings to them, aiming to provide them with financial security. Through diligence, Marta ascended to the role of senior sales manager. Her education empowered her negotiation skills, while her mastery of technical jargon bolstered her credibility with the company's partners. After two years in this position, she propelled the small company to a regional level, attracting orders from across the country. However, a surprise awaited her. The director, on the brink of retirement, hinted at the imminent purchase of the company by larger business entities. These corporate sharks, intrigued by the sudden success of the small firm in the capital, expressed interest in acquisition. However, the director was not inclined to relinquish the company without a strategic plan. Instead, he made an unexpected move by entrusting Marta with the entire company's stake, appointing her as the CEO. This abrupt turn of events left Marta utterly stunned. Gonzalo, I'm struggling to comprehend this, Marta expressed, her disbelief evident. Are you proposing to hand over the entire company along with the CEO position to me? Why? This company means as much to you as your own child, doesn't it? Please, Marta, try to stay calm, the director responded with unwavering resolve. All the necessary paperwork has been meticulously prepared. You only need to sign it. I firmly believe that the company will be in capable hands. I trust that you won't allow it to falter, 
especially once we finalized the merger with them. But what if we don't merge? Marta persisted. They can't coerce us into it. We have a choice whether to join their conglomerate or not. Gonzalo, his brows furrowed, emphasized the significance of the deal, stating, Marta, we cannot afford to miss this opportunity. We've invested considerable time in establishing collaboration with such a powerful industrial giant. We need their financial backing, otherwise, we'll be confined to menial tasks, fading into obscurity. A merger with another company would significantly elevate us, providing a consistent flow of orders from global giants. Though I never had children, Gonzalo continued earnestly, you've achieved the unthinkable with my company. I want you to continue steering it forward. Trust me, it's better for everyone. Please, don't argue with me. I'm too old to repeatedly explain my decisions. Try to accept it as an inevitable outcome. Marta, though taken aback, acquiesced to Gonzalo's wishes. All right, Gonzalo. I'll accept it as you wish. But leading this company is a tremendous honor for me. I promise I won't let you down. The director nodded contentedly, making a note in his leather diary. Excellent. I'll require the annual report for the previous operational period of the company, he requested. I need to review some figures before fully entrusting the management to you. A few days later, Marta ascended to the position of CEO within the company. Her tenure coincided with a significant merger and acquisition agreement that unfolded at the highest echelons of negotiation. Marta, showcasing her acumen, secured highly favorable terms from the new business partners. This strategic maneuver allowed Marta's company to maintain its autonomy by becoming the official contractor for its esteemed peers. Gonzalo's foresight proved astute as the company branched into a distinct sector within another corporation, affording them access to the parent company's resources while continuing their established operations. At a remarkable pace, Marta transformed from an earnest and somewhat inexperienced intern into a thriving young businesswoman. She adeptly navigated the intricacies of managing seasoned professionals while possessing a keen sense of financial value. Not a single promising deal or potential contract eluded her, as she insisted on personally overseeing all facets of the company. This hands-on approach rapidly elevated Marta to the level of her senior counterparts. Her dedication earned not only their respect but also active participation in crucial international contracts. However, beneath her business prowess, Marta harbored a deep romanticism and an unspoken desire for personal fulfillment. Her heart yearned for miracles and the realization of her long-held dreams, especially her yearning for a family of her own. Amidst her involvement in an international business and trade forum, where Marta showcased her company's offerings to foreign counterparts, she encountered Miguel. In a whirlwind of passion, Marta found herself captivated by Miguel's unconventional appearance and magnetic charisma. He possessed a tall, muscular physique, jet black hair contrasting with pale skin, and entrancing deep blue eyes, reminiscent of the fairy tale prince she had often envisioned in her childhood dreams. Their connection was instant as they found common ground and engaging conversation topics, setting the stage for a potential unfolding of something more profound between the two young individuals. It emerged that Gomez worked as the chief designer in one of the prominent architectural firms within the city. However, he had long harbored aspirations of securing a position at Marta's company, recognizing better career prospects there. How lucky I am to have met you! Marta, Sid, with a laugh, remarked. We're actually in search of a new head for the design department at my company. As soon as Sid mentioned her role and position at the company, Miguel's eyes sparked with intense interest, a flame of ambition and greed flickering within him. Yet, Marta remained oblivious to his hidden motivations. Without delay, the young man requested an interview for the chief designer role, using the pretext of walking Marta home that evening. Although Marta was financially well off enough to afford a good car, she preferred the convenience of a business class cab, steering clear of the typical hassles that come with car ownership. When she agreed to Miguel's proposal and stepped into his car, unaware of the repercussions, she had no inkling of the ensuing consequences. 
The charming designer initially invited Marta to his place for a casual cup of coffee, which unexpectedly led to her spending the night at Miguel's apartment. She found herself unable to resist the allure of this tall, confident, and attractive man. Their relationship unfurled in a whirlwind of intense passion, akin to a true typhoon. They found themselves constantly engulfed in tension, unable to suppress their fiery emotions. Weekends were spent jetting off to places like Nice and Milan, vacations in Hawaii, and Sunday outings to operas in Paris. To Marta, it all felt like a fairy tale come to life. However, she remained unaware that the extravagant pleasures were all financed through numerous loans that her lover had accrued, all part of his elaborate plan to secure marriage to the affluent owner of a construction company. Nevertheless, the proposal to become Miguel's wife, extended against the backdrop of the Metropolitan Opera's musical performance in New York, was embraced by Marta without a hint of hesitation. Her elation was so profound that she scarcely pondered the swiftness of this significant step. The magic of the moment rendered Marta unusually susceptible, casting aside any doubts about the authenticity of her passionate lover's feelings. Even the unexpected request from Miguel, which surfaced almost immediately after her affirmation, did not surprise her. Marta, forgive me if this seems quaint or old-fashioned, but may I ask you for one tiny favor? Miguel ventured. Anything, my love, Marta replied, brimming with affection. Could I take your last name when we're married, my darling? Miguel inquired. Marta regarded him with a mixture of surprise and adoration. But I adore your last name, Gomez. I was thinking of taking your last name and being Marta Gomez. Doesn't that sound lovely? A flicker of irritation flashed through Miguel's blue eyes momentarily, swiftly masked by a contrived smile. Perfect had to be the order of the day, he needed her complete belief in him. Of course, he responded with a strained grin. But then, the paperwork involved in changing your name would be quite cumbersome. The company might not want to invest so much time in altering documentation. Let's maintain it as it is. I'll take your last name, and you won't have to make any changes. Marta was touched by a warm surge of tenderness. Darling, are you truly willing to do this for me? she naively expressed, her delight evident. How thoughtful of you. I never realized how caring you are. It just proves once more that I've chosen the most exceptional man in the world to be my husband. I'll do anything for you, my love. Miguel responded softly, I will always do everything for you, my love, before enveloping Marta in a tight embrace and bestowing upon her a prolonged and impassioned kiss that left her feeling exhilarated and lightheaded. The young couple exchanged vows merely a month after their engagement. Amidst the whirlwind of whispers behind the CEO's back, rumors about Marta's swift and impulsive marriage buzzed through the office corridors. Nonetheless, Marta remained indifferent to the workplace gossip, her focus centered on her newly formed marital bliss. Almost immediately, Miguel assumed the position of the head of the design department at his wife's company. He appeared content, enveloping Marta in an aura of care and affection. However, it wasn't until Marta found herself on the precipice of a life-threatening situation that she realized the ulterior motive behind Miguel taking her last name. It dawned on her that the choice was strategic, designed to facilitate smoother paperwork when he eventually took control of the company as the direct heir of his ailing wife. Recollections from their lavish wedding flooded Marta's mind. The opulence and grandeur of the ceremony had left her friends awestruck. The bride and groom had adorned themselves in couture attire and jewelry, exuding an air of true celebrity status. The extravagant ceremony unfolded on an exorbitantly priced snow white yacht rented for the entire night. Among the guests, the bride's parents, humble retired engineers, stood out. While they outwardly displayed happiness for their daughter's apparent joy, their expressions betrayed their inner apprehension. They harbored doubts about Miguel being the ideal match for their independent and accomplished daughter. In a private moment during the festivities, Marta's father, Andres, took her aside, expressing his concerns in hushed tones. Marta, sweetheart, are you certain that the man you married this morning is deserving of you, he inquired softly. Perplexed, Marta looked at her father with suspicion, 
defending her husband. Of course, Dad. Miguel and I love each other, and our bond is unbreakable. Why would you question that? Andres, with a peculiar expression in his eyes, hesitated before responding. I'll be honest, dear. I'm not fond of him. He lacks sincerity, appears artificial. He's akin to a vampire with his blue eyes and pale skin. Beware, Marta. Marta withdrew her hand from her father's firm grip, bewildered by his words. What are you implying, Dad? Miguel is as close to me as you and Mom. I won't tolerate anyone speaking ill of him, not even you. Her father, visibly surprised by her reaction, attempted to reassure her. No one said anything like that. Just exercise caution. Trust my instincts as an engineer, he's not as straightforward as you believe. The tension between Marta and her family escalated that night. While her parents hesitated to fully accept Miguel, they endeavored to contain their disapproval, not wanting to mar the celebrations entirely. Once again, Marta found herself berating her past choices, regretting her dismissal of the heartfelt warnings from her dearest loved ones. She resigned herself to an overwhelming sense of inevitability, believing that whatever was destined to occur would indeed transpire. Fatigue enveloped Marta as she grappled with the burgeoning hatred festering within her heart toward her husband. Her marriage with McGill had endured for merely two years before she received the harrowing diagnosis of a tumor. Initially, the symptoms seemed innocuous. Marta experienced escalating bouts of dizziness, initially dismissing them as mere migraines. However, as the attacks intensified and the headaches grew excruciatingly acute, her husband, recognizing the severity of the situation, urged her to seek medical attention. Yet, Miguel's demeanor underwent a stark transformation following her diagnosis. While outwardly displaying care and concern, he surreptitiously began to examine the company's documents and the substantial stock portfolio, which, until then, had exclusively belonged to Marta. The revelation of the stark truth struck Marta with horrifying lucidity. She finally comprehended that her beloved husband had clandestinely plotted a contingency plan to swiftly assume control of her company upon her demise. In this diabolical scheme, Marta was relegated to the role of a tragic martyr, a mere facade to conceal the atrocities planned by her husband. In a twisted spectacle, Miguel intended to honor Marta's memory as a deceased wife, whom he himself planned to kill. Together with his mistress, he aimed to seize control of the company and access all of Marta's finances. What tore at Marta's soul most was the genuine love she had harbored for her husband all along. She couldn't fathom that he was capable of such despicable actions. Her fairy tale had shattered, leaving behind a desolate landscape of grey ashes and profound disillusionment. As Marta slowly regained consciousness, she struggled to open her eyes fully, her body yet to regain full sensitivity. She lay in bed, unable to rise, when the attending nurse, Angelica, entered the room unexpectedly. Observing Marta's efforts to open her eyes and regain consciousness, Angelica couldn't contain her joy at the apparent progress. You've regained consciousness. That's wonderful news, Angelica exclaimed, genuinely elated at Marta's signs of improvement. With a slight movement of her hand, Marta brushed away the black bangs that adorned her pretty, slightly oriental face, acknowledging the nurse's presence in the room. I'm really happy for you, Marta Gomez. I'll go straight away to inform the doctor about your condition. I believe your husband will rush over like a prince carrying a bunch of bright red roses. As soon as he finds out Angelica had a childlike sincerity that all her patients loved. Marta was really happy that she was the first person to walk into the room and see her awake. However, when Marta heard about her husband and the doctor, she shook her head in denial. No, don't tell them anything, please. What? She did not understand and leaned closer to her. Don't tell my husband that I've come to my senses and don't tell the doctor either. They are in cahoots. Angelica gazed at Marta, her expression one of bewilderment. However, after checking around discreetly to ensure no one else was present, she quietly shut the door and perched on the edge of the bed, ready to hear Marta's tale. 
Struggling with her breathing and stuttering through her words, Marta recounted her harrowing experience. Once she finished, Angelica pondered for a moment before suddenly suggesting a risky idea. Look, Marta Gomez, it goes against the rules, but I empathize with you so much that I want to assist. I have relatives in a village, my grandmother Gabriela. She's a skilled healer, practiced in curing people for years. Perhaps she could aid you in some way. I'll inform her about your situation, but we must act swiftly. Today, Dr. Benito Lidalgo is away, engrossed in a card game, so no one will check on you. Tomorrow morning, you'll undergo some tests revealing the truth about your condition, known to both your doctor and your husband. I'm willing to do whatever it takes, Marta struggled to express, her voice trembling, desperate to escape her predicament. Nodding in affirmation, Angelica swiftly jotted down the address of the remote village and provided details of a bus that would take Marta there. This village is secluded and ancient. No one will search for you there, Angelica assured her. My grandmother has aided many, if you place your trust in her, she'll help you recover too. Marta silently nodded, gratitude shining in her eyes as she carefully concealed the address in her shirt pocket. With determination, she readied her patient attire, preparing for her imminent escape. A short while later, Angelica returned to the room, clutching a small syringe filled with a specialized medication. I'm going to administer an injection with a special medicine. It will help you wake up and regain sensitivity in your limbs quickly. When you feel prepared, don't hesitate for a moment. You must escape just before dawn. That's when the guard usually takes a nap before the hospital opens. I'll assist you and provide money for the ticket. I've already informed my grandmother, and she'll understand once you arrive," Angelica explained. As soon as the medicine entered Marta's bloodstream, she experienced a surge of powerful energy, compelling her body to rapidly reacquire basic motor skills. Almost on command, she attempted to rise from the bed and miraculously succeeded. In the dead of night, Marta had some time to move around her room, thankfully provided as an individual suite by her husband's generosity. Subsequently, she quietly signaled Angelica, who was on duty that night, from the hallway. The two women stealthily made their way out of the hospital through an emergency exit. Before parting ways, Angelica embraced Marta tightly. Good luck, Angelica whispered earnestly from the depths of her heart. I hope you can recover and start anew. Thank you, Marta expressed tearfully. I'll never forget you, Angelica. I'll tell your grandmother what a courageous granddaughter she has. God willing, we'll meet again, Angelica said before Marta departed. The following morning, Angelica informed Benito Hidalgo that the patient remained in a coma, delaying the inevitable moment when the surgeon would discover Marta's absence. Convinced by the nurse's update, the doctor believed the comatose patient wouldn't move and attended to other patients, unaware of Marta's escape. Thirty minutes later, Benito returned to Marta's room, intending to assess her condition and order necessary tests. His shock was palpable upon discovering the absence of the pale, blonde beauty who had been restrained to the hospital bed, instead, there was only an empty room. Angelica, come here now, the surgeon bellowed, beckoning the nurse urgently while clutching his head in disbelief. Enduring the doctor's outbursts and insults, Angelica persistently claimed she had dozed off, taking blame for her negligence. She couldn't fathom how the patient, especially in such a weakened state, could have escaped from the room. Frustrated, Benito Hidalgo called Miguel and delivered the distressing news. Marta's husband, caught off guard, reacted with shock to the unexpected development. An hour later, seething with anger, Miguel stormed into the clinic, immediately confronting the surgeon. He grabbed the doctor by the shoulders and violently shook him, his frustration evident. You liar. Who assured me she wouldn't recover? Who swore she wouldn't get better? Where's my wife? Miguel demanded, his grip on the doctor unrelenting. Attempting to protect his reputation and income, the confused surgeon resorted to cunning tactics. Calm down, Miguel Gomez. It's a force majeure situation. No one knows how your wife managed to escape, but she won't get far.
trust my medical experience, the surgeon claimed, trying to allay Miguel's fury. What do you mean? Miguel growled, refusing to release his hold on the doctor. I mean her diagnosis and condition. Prepare the inheritance documents, she has a month, maybe less, Benito Hidalgo explained with a wicked grin, his hands gesturing in an apologetic manner. Reluctantly releasing the doctor, Miguel warned fiercely, if it turns out my wife is alive, you'll reimburse me everything you earned, plus interest. Understand? The surgeon hastily nodded as Miguel left the hospital. Meanwhile, Marta managed to reach the bus station and board a bus, her body trembling, a pounding headache disrupting her thoughts like a cacophony of exploding firecrackers. Upon being dropped off at the designated stop, Marta felt as though she couldn't endure any more, it seemed she might collapse right there in the grass and drift into an eternal slumber. Summoning the last of her strength, Marta staggered towards the witch doctor's house, slumping down before the door. Exhausted, she lacked even the energy to knock. However, as if anticipating her arrival, the door swung open, revealing a tall, sturdy woman in her seventies standing at the threshold. Her snow-white hair was neatly covered by a dark kerchief, and her stern countenance exuded nothing but serenity and understanding. So, you made it after all. I was almost ready to venture into the woods to find you, the old woman remarked, ushering Marta inside and gently placing her on a white bed adorned with fresh linens. Gabriella ran her hands over Marta's head as the latter lay unconscious, drawing a solemn conclusion. I'll have quite a task with you. Angelica shared everything about you and your husband, the demon who drinks your life away, Gabriella stated firmly. But he'll face the consequences for all he's done. God sees everything. We'll overcome this, my dear. Stay strong and patient. As Marta began to regain consciousness, all she could plea was, don't hand me over to him, I beg you. Angelica said you could help. I can indeed help, Gabriella affirmed. But my aid will be futile unless you believe in your own healing and in finding God within your heart. I can do it, Marta whispered weakly before slipping back into unconsciousness. From that day forth, Gabriella and Marta embarked on their arduous journey. The elderly woman diligently concocted various potions for Marta daily, administered precisely at specific hours. Additionally, she employed ancient incantations, whispering them into Marta's ear. Marta was required to recite prayers continually and maintain a strict fast. Initially finding much of Gabriella's methods peculiar, Marta eventually embraced them willingly. Gradually, she began fasting and devoutly uttering sacred prayers to all the saints she knew. That's why you fell ill, your husband was a natural vampire, the old witch doctor disclosed to Marta. He drained your strength and youth. He watched you like a spider, waiting for you to surrender. He hoped for an accident, a car crash or a fall from a cliff. The scoundrel waited for the disease to take control, something so potent that regular medication couldn't aid. Did he really wait for that? Marta inquired, impressed by the elderly woman's insight. Not consciously, but his dark soul shadowed you, Gabriella replied. Marta was horrified by this revelation but strangely found herself believing Gabriella. She recalled her father's initial instincts about her future husband, whom he had identified as a vampire at first glance. Regrettably, she had disregarded her father's warnings, even shouting in annoyance. After almost nine months and twenty-three days, Marta not only conquered death but also overcame her severe illness. MRI scans at another municipal hospital confirmed her complete recovery. Finally freed from the disease, Marta embraced a normal life. Preferring the countryside, she stayed at Gabriella's house, where the old woman graciously offered her a small room at the back. Marta assisted with household chores, tended the vegetable garden, and delved into the wisdom of spiritual life, visiting the local church almost daily. She earnestly believed that besides the witch doctor's herbs, a form of divine providence had aided her recovery. Eager to learn more, Marta sought permission from the local priests to assist with church services. They welcomed her warmly, allowing her to help clean the altar's candle burnings, tidy the main hall, 
and at times, aid the sisters in the church kitchen to provide for those in need who sought their assistance. One day, as Marta was walking home from church, she stumbled upon a distressing sight. A young boy, about three or four years old, was attempting to flee from a skinny, intoxicated woman who pursued him menacingly, wielding a large and fearsome-looking rolling pin. Come here, you little, why'd you break my vodka? You're in trouble now, the slurring woman yelled, causing the boy to run as fast as he could. But his efforts were in vain as he stumbled and collapsed into the yellowed grass, crying loudly. Stop it. What are you doing? Marta intervened indignantly, shielding the child from his drunken mother. He's your son. How can you dare to hit him? The woman momentarily froze, eyeing Marta's long skirt and modest, light-colored kerchief that covered her head. Are you one of those? Well, a nun? she asked with a slurred voice. Not exactly. What then? Marta inquired, holding the frightened child securely in her arms, meeting the woman's gaze boldly. The woman's eyes shifted from understanding to anger and resentment. If you're not one of them, you shouldn't meddle with someone else's child. Where did you come from anyway? I haven't seen you here before. She's with me, Guinness. Don't touch her, Gabriella intervened abruptly, appearing seemingly out of nowhere in this small female gathering. Giving the skinny woman a stern look, Gabriella reproached her. You're drunk again, Innes. Does your husband know what you're doing while he works hard to provide for you? You have no idea how tough it is to work in the North. The witch doctor's dark green eyes bore into the drunken mother, as if imploring her to recognize her maternal instincts and conscience. Why did he break my bottle? The woman attempted to change the subject, pointing an accusatory finger at Marta. This weird girl came out of nowhere, trying to tell me how to live my life. You should have your own baby first and then teach others how to live. No, I'm not giving the baby to that woman, Marta firmly stated to Gabriella. When his father returns, then we'll see. This is absurd. Ina exclaimed, attempting to snatch the boy from Marta's arms. However, Marta skillfully resisted, preventing Ina from taking the child. I'll go to the police and file a report. They'll arrest you quickly, damned witches. Ina yelled before storming off, heading towards the post office, which happened to be in the direction of the police station. I wonder what you intend to do with the baby, the old woman asked with a sly squint. I don't have the proper conditions for a baby. You have to take care of him yourself, Marta replied. Do you even know how? I'll learn, Marta answered confidently, then began singing to suit the crying boy. Implying a subtle challenge, the old woman muttered, well, well, learn, and followed Marta with a slight chuckle. True to her word, Marta took care of baby Enrique until his father, Ramon, returned from his demanding job up north. Unaware of his wife's excessive drinking and infidelity during his absence, Ramon visited Gabriella's house to collect his son and express gratitude to Marta for looking after him. Ramon, a tall and sturdy man, immediately took a liking to the young blonde girl with a mysterious past. However, Gabriella warned him that Marta was married and advised him to wait until she divorced her husband, the vampire. Acting swiftly, Ramon initiated divorce proceedings, quickly severing Marta's parental rights. Despite Ness's hysterical outbursts and threats of curses directed at Gabriella and Marta in court, the judge ruled in favor of granting full custody of the boy to his father, declaring Ness's lifestyle to be immoral. Following their growing friendship, Ramon proposed officially dating Marta without concern for the judgmental neighbors. She was keen, but a lingering problem in the city held her back from entering a new relationship. I know you're married, Ramon acknowledged, what's stopping you from divorcing that monster? I'll wait for you. Forever, if needed. So will Enrique. You'll make a great mother to him. You're closer to him than his biological mother. Ramon clenched his fist, expressing his disdain for his ex-wife's disruptive influence. She's ruined our lives for too long. Thankfully, she has no right to approach Enrique now. I really want to be with you and Enrique. 
I swear, Marta crossed herself three times, but it's not as simple as you think. If I could just come to my husband, I would have filed for divorce long ago, but there's a different story. The man nodded understandingly, Ramon assured the girl that he would wait for her and that he believed they would be together no matter what. Marta, if necessary, I can talk to your husband, Ramon offered. I'll handle it discreetly so no one finds out. The man joked Smiln. Though grateful, Marta politely declined. She appreciated Ramon's readiness to protect her, unlike her ex-husband's fatal passion. Ramon's reliability and kindness were endearing, covering her with a sense of comfort whenever she looked at him. Meanwhile, Miguel, now officially widowed and in control of Marta's company, struggled with the managerial responsibilities. Despite being a designer by profession, he took charge, leading the company to suffer significant losses. McGill, choosing not to fret over it, delegated most responsibilities to his deputies, neglecting the company's welfare. Amidst Miguel's indulgence with his mistress, Adela, spending the money Marta had earnestly earned, Marta relished her peaceful life in the village with Enrique and Ramon, finding new meaning in her days. Yet, the lingering sorrow was the neglected state of their old church, desperately in need of renovation, lacking sufficient funds. For the first time since her escape, Marta pondered about her company's state and the account she had entrusted with money transfers. Fate offered her the chance to uncover the truth sooner than expected. Ramon departed on a business trip, leaving Enrique under Marta's care. The boy, now openly calling her mom in public without hesitation, accompanied her to the post office. Marta queued up to collect a package containing candles for the church, purchased with parishioners' donations. Amidst the free magazines, a colorful society magazine caught her eye, bearing the stunning news of Miguel Gomez, the multimillionaire, set to marry his fiancée Adela that weekend. Feeling a pang of despair, Marta gazed at their picture, the couple appearing joyous. Yet, she couldn't expect otherwise, they lived off her money. This moment was decisive for Marta. Accepting the consequences, she decided to confront the one who had callously betrayed her and nearly shattered her faith and goodness. Dressed in her usual church attire, Marta journeyed to her ex-husband's wedding, bringing Enrique along. She aimed to look into the eyes of the man who had wronged her so profoundly. Arriving at the lavish wedding in an expensive restaurant, exclusive to VIPs and media figures, Marta presented herself as a church representative, claiming that Miguel had requested her presence to organize a subsequent church ceremony with the bride. Regrettably, no one was available to look after Enrique that day, making it impossible for Marta to attend her ex-husband's wedding without the boy. The hesitant security guard finally allowed her entry, and she settled Enrique at a table with some sweets before discreetly approaching the DJ to request a few moments on the microphone. I'd like to extend my congratulations to the newlyweds, Marta said with a serene smile. Surprised, the DJ handed the microphone to the poised nun, and the guests grew curious about the unexpected greeting. Turning towards her ex-husband and his new bride, Marta spoke clearly into the microphone, her voice carrying across the room. Well, Miguel, are you enjoying a comfortable life with money that isn't rightfully yours? You've chosen a stunning bride, she's the same girl you were speaking to on the phone in the hospital while your wife was suffering, chained to the bed. Miguel and Adela stared at Marta in sheer horror as she vividly recounted the betrayal inflicted upon her by her ex-husband and his mistress. The guests were left in stunned silence, unsure if the church representative was speaking the truth or if she had lost her sanity. One thing was certain, the wedding was irreparably marred. Marta. Miguel exclaimed in shock, confirming the authenticity of her words, much to everyone's realization. A few days later, Miguel was dismissed from the company, completely cut off from Marta's finances and the company's assets. Consumed by shame, he had no choice but to depart the country with his mistress, taking what little money he had withdrawn from the accounts. Marta reclaimed her true identity and promptly initiated divorce proceedings, vowing never to associate with him again. Using her remaining funds, she embarked on a noble mission, constructing a new church in the village. 
Collaborating with sisters and monks from a nearby monastery, they repurposed the old church into a haven for the ailing and homeless, offering essential aid, meals, and temporary refuge. Adjacent to the new church, Marta established a specialized hospital catering to those who, like her, had lost faith in conventional healing methods. Here, a fusion of ancient homeopathy and modern medical advancements, intertwined with spiritual practices, provided holistic care for those in need. Marta's groundbreaking therapeutic approach worked wonders, instilling newfound confidence in individuals and activating their latent inner strength, tapping into the hidden reserves within their bodies. Its success stories traveled far and wide, transcending neighboring towns and villages, drawing suffering souls from across the country seeking solace in Marta's progressive therapy. Now residing together in tranquility, Marta and Ramon embraced their future plans. The couple eagerly looked forward to their impending wedding, marking a union sealed by love. Amidst this joyous anticipation, Marta, deeply in love with Ramon, anticipated the arrival of their child, nurturing Enrique with boundless affection. Marta's parents, finally visiting them, wholeheartedly blessed their daughter's decisions and witnessed her contentment. Their joy was further amplified when Grandma Gabriella, paying a visit to the newlyweds, bestowed her blessings upon them. As she gazed at the expectant mother's belly, a warm smile graced her lips. Girl, I can sense your imminent happiness. You're going to have twins, Gabriella declared with certainty. Marta reciprocated the smile, acknowledging the blessing. If it's God's will, we'll be blessed with twins. Ramon and I wish for a boy and a girl. Your faith will be rewarded, Gabriella quoted a verse from the Bible, leaving the couple intrigued, awaiting the fulfillment of her prophecy. Though the gender of their future children held no paramount significance, Marta and Ramon eagerly anticipated the arrival of their offspring, ready to cherish and love them unconditionally, regardless of their gender. As they eagerly anticipated their growing family, Marta and Ramon remained open-hearted, welcoming every blessing life had in store for them. If you're enjoying this story as well, please give us a thumbs up. Until next time.